Well, hello. Good evening, you guys. Um, tonight, we have uh, two guests who are very uh, deeply enmeshed in the world of uh, songwriting and music publishing. Uh, Rodney Clausen has written half a dozen country number ones for artists like Jason Aldean, Blake Shelton, Luke Bryan, Big and Rich, and more. Um, he, um, you know, he has uh, co-written Why, Amarillo Sky, and Johnny Cash for Jason. Um, other artists who've recorded his songs are Faith Hill, Big and Rich, and Buddy Jewel. I'm going to let him tell you more about himself as we get going, but you should know that you got the real deal sitting here, and you guys have a, a wealth of information in front of you between, um, uh, you know, between Rodney as a songwriter and. Um, uh, and uh, I'm sorry. And um, and been, Seth, uh, uh, you know, Seth, Seth is here as a music publisher. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Seth just talked about starting an artist development arm of his music uh, publishing uh, company. Is, would that be uh, Seth England uh, as a as a as a, yep. as a as an outgrowth of the music publishing company? Yeah. So. Um, and, and sorry, the music publishing company is, 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 um, is called uh, Big Loud Shirt Music Publishing. Um, so we're going to get speaking about things in general, but um, have your questions ready to go, uh, especially if you see yourselves being uh, involved in songwriting or, uh, or publishing, as so many of our graduates tend to, to, uh, to do. Um, so please uh, welcome uh, Seth England and Rodney Clausen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble for Rodney's bio. You know that, right? Why? <laughs> Why? That was Rodney's bio from probably like 2003. So it was probably like on Amy and I in our office. We didn't send. Rodney's like way cooler than that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you know what? Why don't you tell us how much cooler than that Rodney is right now? Well, uh, Rodney will be this year's Billboard Writer of the Year and probably be BMI Writer of the Year and just got nominated. <laughs> and... Uh, and the one thing, like, when you said Buddy Jewel, I was just like, no, and no offense to Buddy, he's off. I was just like, oh, man. Like, this year, we've, Rodney's set some new personal, like, he was on the new Nickelback record and Saving Abel. And so it's a not bunch just of different, straight up country. No, it's, yeah. it's, it's a bunch of rock and pop, but, yeah, I need to, uh, yeah, you know, you, probably you talk about that. You materials, my man. Yeah, that's one mark on me. I didn't get the right No, no. Um, why don't you actually take this opportunity to tell us your backstory, and, and, and if, Rodney, if you want to, Talk a little bit about your backstory when when Seth's done. We okay. can maybe roll roll from one to the other. So yeah, how do you, what's your what's your path? How um, did you get here. I actually graduated a music business degree from a college in Illinois, a lot smaller than this, and I was promoting shows in college, right. and we actually did it because our campus was much different than this town. Right. We did it because um, there wasn't any cool music coming in, so we went to the head of student life, a buddy of mine and I, and we booked. I don't know if anybody remembers the bands like Copeland and Anne Berlin, yeah, yeah. like all these indie rock bands. And we'd catch them like on a Tuesday or Wednesday night because mm -hmm. college kids would go out any night. And we'd book them in this little 500 seat venue. Right. And then we started doing this big festival. And through that, I met a guy named Craig Wiseman mm -hmm. in Nashville. Big Loud, he is the Big Loud shirt. And um, this was five, five, five and a half years ago. And he wanted to start an artist development wing of his music publishing company. No one in Nashville was doing it, but the labels were, you know, they weren't developing artists anymore. Right, right. And so he had this philosophy that he wanted to bring it in-house. So I originally started working for him to do that and to book artists. Right. The first nine months, he, you know, the people he had there at the time just weren't really the, <laughs> the right direction we should have been hitching the wagons to. Right. And so after the first nine months, I switched to be the creative director and manage the songwriters. Without naming names, could you tell me what you mean when you say, because this is, this is a recurring theme in our, in our course of study, is, you know, um, who are the right people? How do, you, how do you become values aligned with, you know, how do you know when your values align with another, with, 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 a, with a business partner's values? You mean, so you but, said the people that we were involved with, we weren't maybe the right people to hitch our wagon to, as I said, without, without naming names. What? tells you something like that. Man, there's, uh, there was actually three different artists, and each of them had a different reason it didn't work out. One um, wasn't good. Yeah. It just, I mean, there was no, you know, somebody else had signed them, and it wasn't something. No, that matters. Like, I mean, we talk about the strength of the product, right? Yeah. So if the product's not strong, you got nothing to market. You're yeah. being dishonest, right? Yeah. So, all right. Uh, one guy wasn't good. Um, the other guy 
it was a, frankly, since this is a music business, it was a business reason it didn't work out. The other guy was flat out lazy. Bus and, business reason like what? Oh, just it was just the, 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 the logistics of that deal and the oh. business reason just didn't work out. But there were some other issues there. And then the third one, which is the most interesting, five years later to look back on, the most talented guy out of all of them yeah. was just lazy. And I mean, you would, you know, you would actually get him a paying gig and it, he had nothing going on. And it wasn't enough. It was like, dude, right, you right. need to get out and go find some fans. Right, you know? right. so, so yeah, so that's, that was, I mean, there was different reasons, but it all worked out. Um, for a reason, mm -hmm. started managing the publishing company. That's where I met Rodney. He right. was already working with Craig at that time. And then come full circle now, we still run the publishing company and started a artist development right. company and manage a, a band we launched and that I managed Florida Georgia Line. Uh -huh. And um, so now we're kind of back to the reason I started working with Craig, yeah. but doing it in a completely different. So did it take five years to get the artist development thing going? Um, yeah, I mean, yes, it's, it, it did. Yeah, yeah. But during that time, we sort of took a step back to get the publishing company in order, in order, and fire on all cylinders because ultimately that's where we've bred the artists out of. Yeah, yeah. With yeah. with Rodney and, and that's and that's your revenue, your your real revenue stream as well, right? Through now it's both. Kind of I mean, now it's both big time. But um, right. yeah, the publishing company has kept you know, Craig's good. lights on for ten years. Right, right. Yep. Interesting. Uh, Rodney, you want to speak a little bit about your about your background, your 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 path to the where you are now? Well, I grew up in a little farm town in Groover, Texas. Went to college, came back, farmed with my dad for 15 years. Mm -hmm. First time I went to Nashville, I, I was maybe 30 years old right. and was just starting to dabble in songwriting. 12-hour um, days on a tractor lead to a lot of boredom and a lot yeah. of thinking and thought process, and and uh, I started dabbling in songwriting and had. Two or three friends in, in Nashville I had, um, you know, that were part of the business that um, encouraged me when they heard some songs that I'd written, said, hey, you need to come out here and start writing. So, What was your education in? Were you a musician? Were you, uh, were you... No, I got a degree to teach high school history. Okay. So <laughs> I'm only asking because... I went back because... and farmed, and now I'm a songwriter. No, I'm only asking because I, I wonder, I mean, I, I'm guessing they're wondering, uh, are you a musician? Do you, are you an, do, you, do you play an instrument? I grew up playing piano, and then I... Uh, segued into playing guitar, and I write almost everything on guitar right. now. Right, great. And I'm not a great guitar player, but right. I can play good enough to play my own song. To write a song, you know? yeah, yeah. So, that, but, that, that also is eliminating. And you learn that when you move to a town like Nashville. I know New Orleans has a lot of great musicians, but yeah. when you when you move from where I moved from to a music town, yeah. you learn like that. Wow, I'm not near as good as I thought I was because right, some yeah. of the you know best musicians in the world yeah. you know yeah. live in Nashville. Um, so anyway, I, uh, um, I think I made my first trip to Nashville maybe in 96 and, uh, started, you know, sporadically every three or four months I'd go to Nashville and write for a week with different people and, uh. And how did you forge those relationships? Um, just through friends that I, I, I had, uh, a girl that I went to high school with that lived in Nashville, worked for a publishing company. Huh. I had a friend of mine that actually, uh, kid that I coached in high school. When I was going to college, I coached at a Christian school, oh. and I, John Rich was one of my guys on my basketball team. That's great. And we kept in touch, and uh, I ended up, he was a connection I had in Nashville, and then a friend from college actually worked for a different publishing company. Mm -hmm. And all three of them were like, you know, heard my songs and were like, yeah, you need to come out here and pursue this. It might be worth your time. That's great. And, uh, so I... I um, like 1999, I decided, okay, I'm going to go to Nashville one week a month and write. Right. And by, I did that for one year, and then I, I got offered a publishing deal by um, a lady named Sharon Vaughn, small little independent company. I wrote there for one year and uh, segued into a, another publishing deal that lasted for uh, seven years and just basically went back and forth from Texas to Nashville for right. the first six years I had a publishing there. Can you explain what, a, what it means to be signed to a music publishing contract as a songwriter? You know, you said, you know, I, I wrote there for a year. What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Does that mean you delivered finished songs to a responsible party over that time? Or does it mean right. you sat in a room with other writers, you know, it, it, can you explain a little bit well, about the what, you know, life basic, like? basic publishing deal in Nashville is there's an X amount of songs you have to turn in right. every year. Usually it's, it's, a, it's kind of a, 
ridiculous number. It's like 10 songs or 12 songs. Right. And basically, I mean, like I probably wrote over 100 songs last year. Right. So it's only, it's a number like they can, if you're, if you're really irresponsible and don't treat it like a job, then they can get rid of it. It's an easy way for them to get rid of you. But, yeah. you, you know, I write 10 to 12, you have to write 10 to 12 songs a year. Um, we go in, we do a demonstration recording of the song, right. give it to our publisher, I mean, our, our publisher, and it's their job to go out and get it cut. I mean, it's we, we do some of that too. We'll yeah. give it to friends that are producers or people that work at record labels. Yeah, you want to be working at least as hard as your publisher is. Right, right. right. But they, they take the song, they take it to record labels, producers, artists, and try to <laughs> right. try to sell the song. Right, right. Um, can we drop back to that demo recording? Sure. Um, at that point, are you demoing the song yourself, or are you hiring musicians, for everything from, from singers to, to instrumentalists, to be demoing the song? And you supervise that demo? Or are you demoing the song? And, which, and what's, the common, what's the common methodology there? The, common, the, the most common method in Nashville is for we will hire a band, go in and, and uh, have a session, one three-hour session with right. um, union musicians, right. and uh, we'll record five songs. Right. And I like I'm a singer, so I sing all of my demos. Right. But a lot of people that can't sing have to hire someone else to sing their song. But right. basically, we record the song to where it sounds probably 90% as good as it does when it actually gets re-recorded and right. put on the radio. And a lot of times, um, what we go in and do, they, they'll upgrade it. We do it at a demo scale, which is a cheaper. The the, mus the musicians make less money. Yeah. yeah. There's different scales. When it's done at a master scale is what you hear that comes out on the radio, but they'll upgrade what we do mm -hmm. to a master scale, like if, and then and then have the artist come in and sing on it. That happens sometimes. Right. What we do ends up what being what is actually on the record. Oh, wow. I, I, I actually, I want to add to that, just because yeah. there's a lot of students here that, Absolutely. I don't know, anybody songwriters or producers or musicians? A lot it's of actually from, a lot from, of from where I'm, just, just so everyone in here knows, from where I'm sitting, that is where you hire musicians. Yeah. That's the, and I'm assuming, Jim, you do that too, but that's the common way that it's always been done. Right. But in the last 10 years, yeah. the whole bedroom Pro Tools thing has completely taken over. Two or three of the hottest new producers in town, right. country producers, are guys who make tracks in their, you know, in their bedrooms. And one of the guys that Rodney writes with, Chris Tompkins, a lot, he will write on a Pro Tools rig and probably come up with sometimes 25% of the demo, 50% right. or all of it. Right. And then and then he'll give Rodney his files, mm -hmm. and, and it both saves money, but it's a way a creativity. Absolutely, if you're yeah. talented enough to do it. So w the point I'm getting at is, it's really possible for a student here to do the exact same demo process, maybe a Chris Tompkins or a Ross Copperman or somebody else does. Right. If you write country or rock or whatever, you could right. pitch songs from here. I mean, yeah. I just want to say that's possible, but it is. Well, that's what I, I was going right. to segue into that. Uh, some of the people that I write with now that are track guys yeah. that do Pro Tools will have will take the loop, the piano part that they do. We have it all mapped out, and we just have session musicians add right. to what we've already right. started. Right. So you put in a foundation. And we'll even have a finished vocal. We'll take a finished right. vocal into the studio and right. just add to that. Yep. That's great. So, and it gets it, it it gets it headed down the road. It gets it, you know exactly where it's going to end up, and the musicians can actually spend more time making their parts better mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of trying to figure out you know spend twenty minutes trying to figure out what my part's going to be. Right. right. And are you exactly. are you writing charts or are you or most of these people playing from the de I, from the demo? I don't write the chart, but you have a, <laughs> usually you get the session leader will write out right. a you know the the number system yep. chart yep. and yep. they'll play off of that. That's so. great. That's great. Really interesting. So, um, what's you, you know? How about for you, Seth? What's your typical day? Oh man, <clears throat> anymore it's not it's not the same. Um, <laughs> a year and a half ago, it was um, getting in the getting in the office, getting coffee, listening to the new songs that came in yesterday, figuring out where to take them. Right. Music publishing by itself um, is a, is a bit slower. Yeah, in in Nashville, it's, well, what it's, the hell it's do you more, do with a hundred songs from from one honestly, from one guy? Honestly, like, if if you can, and Jim can attest to this, if you write a hundred songs a year and you get ten of those cut, you've had an awesome year. I, that's you've what I'm thinking. Like, year. how are you hearing through that sort of that that that? How are you how are you perceiving signal through noise? You know, and I don't mean to call your other ninety songs noise, but you know what I'm saying. Like, you're getting 
a hundred songs from one writer. Well, okay. are you giving a hundred songs your full attention? Um, no, but no, but you you listen to it the same way you would if you're in a, if you're in, if you're in a car and you're yeah. driving down the road punching through channels. Yeah, you stop on the song that gives right. you some. Sometimes right. you just gotta trust the goosebumps. It's right. like, dude, yeah, right. yeah. I hate cats, but this song is about cats, and it's like making me cry right now. And I have, you know what I mean? It's like you gotta, yeah, yeah, you yeah. gotta trust. You can't, yeah. you know, we we don't write bullet points of like yeah, yeah, what every course. song has. But I will I say know. the best writers in towns are the ones that understand. They they understand kind of that that radio, yeah. what radios the commercial writers right what radios doing, but they can still get it in there, but do something that makes you go. Damn, that was really good. Yeah, so, yeah, and, yeah. and the other analog analogy I didn't come up with, but um, actually Rodney's wife's publisher, I think, said this, and I stole it from him. It's like, you got your wife a publishing deal? Oh, she got herself a publishing no, deal. She's a badass. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you eat a steak every day. Yeah. Steak's going to start to get bland. Yeah, right. But then one night you're going to sit at Morton's and go, holy cow, this is, right. you know what I mean? Yeah, so you kind of know. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for the young writers out there, they write. They've written five songs, and they're the best five they've ever written. Yeah, right. Until you write right. three hundred, and then you he'll, he'll walk in and go, "You got to hear this, dude." Yeah. Well, yeah. from the songwriter's perspective too, we we know that a hundred songs a year aren't going to get cut. Yeah. But I treat it like a job. Every day I'm in Nashville. I'm working on. I'm at the office working on a song, or I'm in the studio. Yeah. And I I always tell people. You write you write through songs to get to that song, the song yeah, that yeah. that that good song, that great song that's going to stand out. And you, and I, you, I, write, I, you write songs to get to that song. Well, I, it reminds me of this. I have a, a, a fairly well known actor friend who says the job is auditioning. The job isn't doing the isn't isn't yeah. acting in the film. The job is auditioning, mm -hmm. and like your job is songwriting. Mm -hmm. It's not writing hits. The job is being the songwriter, and you're going to. Throw out as many as you can possibly. Throw but you got to trust your gut. I mean, I, I, he has stood alone. He, he's brought a song in that he loves that I don't like, and, and we have a great relationship. I'll be honest. And a lot of times he's right, or yeah. he has one that he maybe he wrote and he didn't. I, you know, it's never. Yeah. Or, there was a, a song that Luke Bryan just cut drunk on you, and um, he, all three writers in the room loved it, and I flipped out over it. And I remember the, the co-publisher said. I don't get it. I'm not going to. That yeah. just wasn't their thing. Yeah, but yeah. we were like, dude, we get it. And we're going to just take it into someone's office very proud, you know. So yeah, yeah. there's that, too. I mean, you don't, you got to trust your gut. Is there a lot of in-person pitching? Well, actually, this goes back to what you asked me, what my typical day is like. Yeah, I'm sorry. I cut you off. Every publisher's, every publisher's different. Some, you know, some publishers have a standing meeting every week with the A&R. Like, if they got 20 writers and they got that many songs coming in, yeah. they'll have a, a weekly meeting with different A&R people. And they'll go sit there. Right. Um, uh, so, but you know, if, if you're the A and R person, I got to give it to you. Yeah. And then if you, and then if you like it, that's the first door to get through. And then they got to give it to the producer, and that's the second yeah. door to get through. And the producer's got to give it to the artist. Rarely, right. not many songs get cut that way. It's like direct relationships. In the past year and a half, uh, we launched Florida Georgia Line. So one week a month, or you know, whenever something important is going on. Yeah. We'll be out on the road with them. Yeah. They're on the Luke Bryan tour right now. <clears throat> and my pitching has become more in person and direct to artists. To the artists. When, anytime you can get it in their hand the quickest, yeah. you just streamline it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. through artist management and being around artists in different capacities through touring mm -hmm. has actually allowed us, you know, or, or managing his career, trying to get him on the bus with yeah. artist X to go write for a weekend. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. That's the other mm -hmm. big hurdle you try to get done. It's funny how. how it seems like in every aspect of the business, intermediaries are going away. More and more, it, these, these are, these, they're, there's a facility for direct relationships. Um, yeah, I guess it's important to be part of a system. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as I was saying earlier, artist development <coughs> from that end, labels really aren't doing it anymore. Yeah. They, they're, you know, the labels can't afford to, to throw good money after bad now. Right. Yeah. So they look for trains that are already moving. Yeah, right. And, and then from the business, well, we, yeah, music, we talk about that here all the time. It, it becomes a math problem, not a, not a creative opinion. I mean, yeah. they, they have their creative opinion, right? But rarely is artist X getting signed because they sound good sitting on a stool and singing. It's a calculation. Have they got traction? Yeah. What, you know, what can we help? Yeah. What momentum can we help increase rather than, yeah. rather than create? I mean, there's, there's still A&R people, but yeah. the days of that being the dream job for everyone are really yeah. unrealistic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Rodney, you said something to me before we started talking. I told you it was it was gold. What was it you said about songwriting? Do you not recall? Oh, I, uh, 
He's, what, 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 what question did you ask me? I don't know. I, said I, that? I, I don't know. I can't remember. Anyway, I, I, I said something. It was something so about damn clever. To, I thought you'd remember. You have to to be a, to be a song. You know, in songwriting, we get in a room every day, and you kind of have to bear your soul. I think Jim actually. Oh yeah, we talked about bearing your soul, about, about how brave it's. So Jim was saying, yeah, I've had to say a lot of stuff that, yeah. you know, to Rodney in a writing room that I didn't <laughs> yeah. say normally. But I would say you you have to dare to suck when you write. Yeah, right. You have right. to dare to put it out there, and mm -hmm. you know, have to take a chance on somebody going, dude, that sucks. It's horrible. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And uh, we all, we've all gone through that uh -huh. as, as songwriters. I mean, I know the first five years that I wrote songs, I mean, I, had to, I went back and burned a bunch of <laughs> CDs, yeah, you know. Yeah. I didn't want anybody to hear what I'd done. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you have to, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a process you have to go through. Well, I think that that's, that's, that's fairly important for, for people in this room to hear. Uh, it's, not, it's not good enough to suck, but, it, but you have to dare to suck. You have um, to take the chance. You got to put it out there. Yeah, you have to risk before. something, or else you know, what is it? And, and, and as a band, you know, not, as an artist too, not just a songwriter, an artist or a yeah. band or whatever you want to do. If you got to go for it, and so you know, some people are going to laugh at you. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so how do you set up a, an environment, a writing environment, where you're safe? You feel safe enough. It's a safe place. <laughs> safe place for you to suck. Like, well, where, I mean, how it's do you, not, what is it? Is it just working with the right people? Well, uh, you know, in in Nashville uh, or in you know I, in in L.A. and New York too, a lot there's very few people that write all by themselves. Yeah, most songs that you see have at least a couple of writers on. A lot of the you know R&B hip hop songs. My gosh, I mean, like there's a Rihanna song that was a hit. Uh, was a drink to that or Cheers? Oh. I had like ten writers on. It. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, but you learn the people, you, you figure out through the, you know, a process of elimination, the people that you work good with. Right. And every time you leave the room, you're like, wow, we need to play this for somebody. Right. right. And it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with who's had a lot of success. And because I've written with some super successful songwriters mm -hmm. and we never get anything good. You know, that's funny. And then I write with people that have never had a cut. And every time we write, it's yeah. great. You know, so it's a process of elimination of just finding the people that you click with and a lot of that is just personalities people that like at this point in my career I don't write with anybody that I don't enjoy being around yeah right right and just that in, a, in and of itself when you're your work environment every day is I like this person was there a time when you had to write with people that you didn't oh, really yeah. like oh yeah there's a lot of people you'll write with one time and oh, I'll yeah. call Seth and say don't ever do that again yeah you know? right right but uh, you have to be in a you know, environment where you might have to say, well, hey, man, one time this happened to me, you know? Yeah. yeah. And this is something I don't really talk about, but because of that, I think we should write this song and take it here right. and have this storyline to it. And I think that might really, you know, touch some people or influence right. some people like, you know, Seth, Seth said, you know, make you cry or yeah, whatever. Yeah, give, give, give you some goosebumps. goosebumps. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. So every writing relationship, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I'm going to assume is really different. Uh, like you're, you know, you have a, a relationship with one writer that you co-write with, and and you, it's probably like friend relationships, right? Yeah. I mean, can you, can you talk a little bit about that? How the difference between or how you manage those different relationships? Well, I found um, a lot of times we get to put in the room, like Seth or another publisher, will go, hey, Rodney needs to write with this guy because they're a lot alike. And for me, it seems like that never works. Right. To put me in the room with somebody that's the opposite of me. You know, I'm a guitar guy that grew up on a farm. Put me in the room with the guy that, you know, runs Pro Tools rig and, right. and loves to, you know, build loops right. and beats and, and, and is more on the pop side. Yeah, Let yeah, us yeah. Put something together and see what, you know, it's almost like the hybrid of that. Absolutely. It's yeah. way cooler than putting two guys in the room that came from the same place. Mm -hmm. That makes perfect sound sense. Sound the same. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, we figured out over the course of time that it's way better to write with somebody that's going to stretch you, that's different than you. But at the same time, personality wise, you have to get along. You know, right. you spend, you spend four to eight hours in a, in a small room with somebody. You yeah. know, during the day, you're going to have to get along. Yeah, and what is that, by the way? I mean, none of us, none of us really know. What, 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 what is there, a designated room somewhere? Well, our building, we, uh, 
our building is a three-story building, and all the writer rooms are on the third floor. And it's a music publishing office. The music, so, yeah. so the writers have rooms. And there are eight or ten offices up there. I mean, I, I write in what, maybe a 10 by 12 yeah. square foot, I mean, 10, yeah. 10 feet by 12 foot office. And, yeah. Do you, you vibe know, it got, up, or does it look like a regular office? Got pictures on the wall. That's got good. a couch. Got you know a table, a chair, yeah. a little pro tool set up. And, Hot drinks. Uh, well, now we have to go downstairs for that. We got a water cooler up there. A bunch of crap. But that's good. It's good. <laughs> good exercise walking up and down the yeah, stairs. Yeah, songwriters right? don't get much exercise. You make them walk <laughs> but, uh, for their <laughs> coffee. But uh, so, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but when we show up, and usually like a day for me, you ask about sis day. Yeah. A day for me is I. I usually show up at the office at about 11, mm -hmm. start writing about 11.30, write till anywhere between 3 and 6 o'clock, right. uh, just depending on the day and the person you're writing with and the idea you have. You may finish a song. You may get half a song. Mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, usual day for me. And a lot of times, at, you know, in the evening, then I'll go to the studio mm -hmm. and I'll record or I'll sing, put vocals on stuff that right. we've already recorded. Right. Songwriters have it made. Well, yeah, well, yeah, well, that's not a bad life. They can work like three days a week from 11 to 4, <laughs> let anyone know when they're ready for like a Jimmy John's sandwich, and then when they're not, when they're not feeling creative, they can go fishing for two weeks. It's like amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, what we talk about. We talk about this all the time. I'm like, going to try it. Everybody thinks somebody else's job is easy. But what's the difference between a large pizza and a songwriter? Oh, a large pizza can feed a family of four. That's right. <laughs> that's it. Unless you're successful. Unless you're successful. Yeah. He's good. Um, so you, you talk about the studio, right? Uh, you have like an open account at a recording studio? What's the deal? Um, well, the way our oh, publishing... I get the bill. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> the way our publishing deals work is uh, my publisher pays for the demos, right. which run for one, you know, the, the demos that we do probably run about 750 for one song, right. divided by however many writers that is. So my part of like a song, if you and I wrote a song, you know, we'd be, what, $375 mm -hmm. a piece yeah, on right. that one song. Good, but like and you they, mentioned, at the end of the day, you might go to the studio after, after you've written for a mm -hmm. while. And are you, at that point, starting work on a demo in earnest? Like, that's, that's, those are recordings you're going to keep? Because I was wondering what your scratch pad is, what your audio scratch pad is. Like, where are you documenting what you're doing in the room? Well, what, I do, what we do in the room, I mean... This? iPhone. Yeah. Yeah, voice memo on iPhone. Yeah. It used to be GarageBand, now voice memo on iPhone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I get through writing that, I'll, I put the uh, lyric down in either um, the notepad on my, yeah. on my Mac or Word, a yeah. Word document. I email that to Seth right. and turn it in, and then right. it's officially in Submitted. the system. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, I guess uh -huh. that's technically copyrighted at that point. I yeah, I mean, we have people in the office. It is as soon as you finish writing it. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have people in the office, that, and, and we have actually software on the on the non-creative administrative side. Yeah. There's always a place for people, you know, obviously in the music business, whether you're creative or not. Mm -hmm. They manage, they are a catalog manager, a catalog of right. songs. Right, right. They file them in X number of different places, backups, audio, lyric, right. data creation is super important. Right. You know. And... And all the admin, I mean, are you dealing with admin then and there in terms of, like, copyright admin, basic copyright admin? Yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's people that are going to file the songs. And then when there's activity and royalty, yeah. that's a whole other group of people who collect those royalty right. and, and um, dis distribute them to, yeah. to the writers. Many, many fewer moving parts than a record label, classic mm -hmm. record label, but, but all really vital finance, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. finance repertoire. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Well, the, back up to where, where, we, where we were... I put it on a, I put the, yeah. write a song, put it on voicemail, yeah. build up, a, you know, five, six, seven, eight songs, yeah. go into set and say, hey, I'm recording three songs tomorrow. Right. Which ones do you think I should do? Okay. Which ones do you think we can get cut? Yep. And Will you demo 100 songs a year if you write 100 songs? You demo everything? I probably write closer to 150 songs. Yeah, right. I was going to say that was probably right. just the arbitrary. So you numbers. basically. Probably demo between 80 and 100. So, yeah. So You'll you, probably demo half of what you write, though. Probably. That's what I wanted. That's to know. probably the, yeah. as a, it's more. It's more so as a percentage, right. and every writer is different. But I was going to ask: Do like the songwriters here have they have they been co-writing? I mean, do people like is that something y'all do? Is that uh, how many how many songwriters are here? Hands up. How you, many of you, you have co-written? How many of you have co-written? 
Well, good number. I mean, some, it's, it's, there's some of the most brilliant writers in Nashville don't co-write, but I'm just curious because yeah. I think that's something like, whether you want to be an artist or a, or a songwriter, I think that's something. I know at my college they didn't do it. We taught a music publishing <laughs> class. We had songwriters, and we didn't encourage anybody to collaborate. Right, right. And you, you get in and figure out you hate it, but then you, but at the same time, you, you know, it's like buying insurance for your car is what we tell the artist. It's an insurance. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, Why wouldn't right. you see what you have to offer me? And I, I just think, right. you know, if you're not doing it, you should start doing it, yeah. especially if you want this to be a career. And so you could literally start building up your catalog of songs mm -hmm. now. Right. You know? Absolutely. Instead of waiting yeah. until you're out of school. Yeah, and we talk about the fact that, I mean, we tell them, in all seriousness, write a song every day. If you're a songwriter, write a song every day. And if you write a song, then create a file for that song with your copyright form in it, with your, you know, with a demo of it, with a lead sheet, with the lyrics, you know, uh, and your, and your, you know, your, your ASCAP or BMI clearance. Man, I, the, the Florida Georgia Line guys, they, um, they, they are songwriters at heart. Like, they can't write. Their schedule is now so busy that they're not going to be able to write in a room every day yeah. like Jim and Rodney. But if they're out in the road, I mean, they've just now started getting back to riding on the bus. They figured out a space that they can get creative yeah. in. So we're starting to get the voice memos. Or they'll, he'll get a drunken call at midnight going, dude, I got this title. Let's ride it. Next, you know, so it's yeah, like yeah. They, they, they say there's a, they say there's a, there's a, um, there's a, a song in every conversation. If yeah, you just yeah. got to listen for it. You know, you hear it. And yeah, that's a great, that's a great, that's a great thought. The last, the last song you two actually wrote was spawned from a conversation in New Orleans. Really? Yeah, we got a big love for New Orleans. That's, that's nice. The parts, the parts we remember anyway. Um, now, Rodney, you don't strictly write country music, right? You don't write at all, Seth. You're, just, you're, you're not a creative. Nope. Uh, you, you're, I don't write. you're a publisher. You, yep. you, that's your role. And, and um, how actively are you bringing in new writers? I'm different in that way, especially with our new direction in artist development. We, you know, I, I, all, that being said, though, we've kind of hitched our wagon, so to speak, to Rodney, a guy named Chris Tompkins. Our owner is a songwriter, uh -huh. just signed a girl, Sarah Buxton, mm -hmm. um, a producer, Joey Moy, right. and then Brian and Tyler in FGL, and that's six writers. And, that's, and the producer's a writer. The producer is a writer, right. but he's, he's been more... Um, uh, producing records. I mean, right. he, he did the FGL record, the Jake Owen record. Right. He's been from, in Vancouver doing rock records for years. Right. He like launched the careers of Theory of a Dead Man and right. Nickel. He was a rock guy. Right. And um, but yeah, and that, we have a really small, very independent environment. Right. And it just depends. I mean, we have a lot of big name guys that their percentage of cuts to songs written have been good mm -hmm. as of late. And so there'll be companies with 15 or 20 writers, and we may have a bigger year. But that's just because. Mm -hmm. They may have the brand new kid from Loyola or wherever right. that they're developing, mm -hmm. you know, and it takes mm -hmm. us three and four years just to get the relationships going yeah. and teach them how to be a professional songwriter. Yeah, yeah. We've been working with young artists, developing artists, and introduce them to veteran songwriters right. and let them get mentored a little bit in that way. So what do you see as the kind of the pros and cons between, you know, of being like a boutique company? like yours, you know, an independent company, well, a little more specialized, a little more personal attention? I mean, we're doing the same thing. I mean, Jim writes for a big publishing company as well, a major. There's no, it's just, creatively, we're all trying to hit the same targets. Mm -hmm. Administratively, there actually are some differences. Clearing licenses, mm -hmm. you know, you hear stories of certain artists that go get their major publishing deal. And again, that you just got to, on the front side, you need to work that out with your whatever publisher you sign with. If, if ESPN, here's a great example, they came in and they want to use some Florida Georgia Line material. Right. But ESPN, MTV, they don't want to pay a bunch of money because they're ESPN yeah, and MTV yeah. for the usage. Yep. So as long, you know, we can clear it fast because we know that's great exposure for them. Yeah. A major publisher, and again, I think they're all starting to learn they, they, they can't they, do this. They, won't clear they may the drag their license, feet because they're yeah. like, yeah, we don't, we don't license for yeah. anything less than this amount of money. While that is a good principle and rule of thumb to have yeah. for songwriters only. Right for artist driven things and you know other ways that you can make income yeah, off yeah. of your song being on sports center or whatever it is yeah sure that's so as an independent publisher we can actually look at it from a sort of ancillary residual more of a view. holistic view yeah. Yeah, yeah that's one way i mean you can right. you can um you're <clears throat> dealing directly with us instead of some policy right policy by committee or something yeah right right um speak a little bit about what you mean when you talk about artist development because you know we've we've uh, I certainly know we've brought it up in a lot of classes. It's the lost art from the record business days, you know, from, I mean, from the record company days. Mm -hmm. Artist development is used as sort of a buzzword, 
But when you say artist development, what specific areas and disciplines are you referring to bringing out you know, on behalf of mm -hmm. your artists? Well, it's different with every artist. I mean, you go see, you know, you go see U2 yeah. in a football stadium. It's like they didn't start like that. Mm -hmm. And every day they're evolving and getting better still yet. They're, they, U2 still develops their own show. They film it. So at that level. Mm -hmm. But then, um, again, I'm going to use Florida Georgia Line as the example. Okay. This was a year and a half ago, I think. <clears throat> we had set an agenda. We made it. We had negotiated a joint venture with Joey and another guy out of Canada. That we were going to work together, and um, we set out. We're like, we're going to go find some young artists that need developed. Again, maybe their songs are great and they sing great. Yeah. They need to, you know, hit the treadmill and eat the, yeah. <laughs> eat the go to the produce section. You know what I mean? I mean that's just part of it. In the case of Florida Georgia Line, um, and we people like Rodney, we would bring them out to their early shows. Mm -hmm. We went out there, yeah. and it was like, man, they were writing all the songs by themselves, mm -hmm. finding a buddy to produce it. Mm -hmm. They were literally, literally going into debt to tour, right? Because right. they they weren't looking for a record deal; they were looking for fans. As they one yeah. of their brilliant statements they made, mm -hmm. and what we saw was their like extreme desire to entertain people. Uh -huh. They would sing, <laughs> sing these like very basic <laughs> songs, <laughs> but they would jump up on the monitor and try to get everyone to get their beers in the air, and it was a great time. It was like, holy cow, this is like, yeah. this is, this is like dramatic and over the top, but just mm -hmm. paired with hit songs. Mm -hmm. You know, vocal instruction, studio experience. Mm -hmm. Staging. Uh, staging, cool clothes, you know, that, that thing. So that, mm -hmm. was, that was what they needed. And, right. and then they needed to, they were actually, they're actually tremendous songwriters. Mm -hmm. They needed to go write with veteran songwriters mm -hmm. and sort of, learn the framework a little bit more. Right. In the case of them, you know, like I said, they came in and, and I would say, you're gonna go right with Rodney or Jim or Chris or whoever, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, mm -hmm. we're gonna find you the right booking agent and you're gonna go tour Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Mm -hmm. You're gonna drive home Sunday and hit repeat. Yeah, great. You know, and then um, we're gonna take you down to the, to the mall and get you, <laughs> get you clothes that look good and right. that, yeah. that whole thing. I mean, it's yeah. just the whole, Right. You know, it's whatever your agenda was. It could be opposite. They could have amazing songs and mm -hmm. have no performance experience. And we well, they could have amazing them. clothing. They could have amazing... <laughs> Not yeah. be good musicians. Yeah, I love that. And then... Um, so, you're, just to just create a, something of a sports analogy, I mean, you're taking talented high school athletes and sending them to the football academy. That's exactly basically. it. No, that's, that's, it's the minor leagues for baseball. Yeah, right. You know, and it's... And, and um, in the case of them, it was really interesting. Actually, from, from a business perspective, this is what, to tell you, this is not the old music business. Yeah. FGL was actually offered and accepted a merchandise deal, mm -hmm. a company to come in and run their merchandise store because of the business they were creating on the road before they were offered a record deal. Right. right. And it's really, and, and, there, and there were guys with record deals in town that that merchandise company would not offer a deal to right. because they didn't. So yeah. the record deal is not the end game. No, no, no. And especially no. in country music, in the last five years, blogs are now, you know, in, in like alt rock or indie rock, it's all about let's get on Day Trotter and this blog and, mm -hmm. or hip hop, you know, let's get a mixtape, mm -hmm. you know, and let's see how many peop, you know, times people download it on the mixtape. Mm -hmm. Country is actually now starting to get a little more modern. Right. And the demographic is not just your 35 to 44 year old women. It's right. actually getting young and hip and cool. Right, right. Truthfully, and, yeah. and that's, you know, one of the reasons FGL is working is because Country Radio wants to find a couple younger yeah. driven bands yeah, to right. get the college kids to go right. listen to. But um, yeah, it's, you know. Now having said all that, you don't only write country music, Rodney. No, I, I mean, we, we bring a lot of rock acts in. Um, Three Days of Grace has been in the office a lot. Um, I know Nickelback's not cool to throw out there, but we, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, uh, we rub shoulders with them and yeah, yeah. Uh, um, we, saving we, Abel. Yeah, we've know. been, for some reason, we like, I don't know how this happened. Actually, Ron Berman, who used to be the head of a at Roadrunner, we became really close friends mm -hmm. with him, and for some reason, we got like really tight with all these like, call them jaw singers, you know, you put your foot up on the microphone, yeah, like yeah. Scott Statt from Creed, but the songs are kind of <laughs> written the same. We as call them, we call them, uh, Cheminet singers. Cheminet. Because <laughs> they're always doing a Cheminet. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> but it's actually, it's actually fun. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Alice in Chains, the <coughs> Creed dude, you know. We'll do pop stuff too, like Plain White Tees. Um, yeah. We'll be on the next Kelly Clarkson record. Right. And we've started like, I've started getting this relationship started with like Dr. Luke's camp. Yeah. You know, all these, all these mm. writers in LA that can't seem to, they don't want to use their actual 
given name. Right, right. <laughs> the name's like Circuit and Jay Cash right, yeah. and oh, like, wow. Rodney Claus and he uses his real name. Right. He, must be, he must be boring. <laughs> no, he just uses his given name. Yeah. We can name you Sprocket. <laughs> just give you that one. That's free. <laughs> I, um, uh, what do you, you know, uh, I, there's a question here that I don't, I don't understand. Was there questions going to be from the students? Were, they gonna, were we going to yeah, do that? Yeah, we okay. want questions awesome. from the students, so are we about there? No, I'm just asking. I think in 15 minutes. Yeah, we're probably there. I've just been uh, in there. See, I just didn't there. ask anything about Big Loud Shirt's relationship to Big Loud Mountain. And I don't, sure I don't is, know what, what okay, that means. Big Loud Shirt is a whole, Craig Wiseman wholly owns that publishing company. Right. Mountain is a joint venture between Shirt, who I work for, mm -hmm. and two other guys. Okay. One's an artist manager, one's a producer. I see. So we just sort of, and that's our artist development venture. I see. And it was a, a place, as Craig would say, it's, it's like a buffet. If you leave here hungry, it's your own fault. There's, you know, you can go to Shirt, go right with the writers, yeah. you can go to the producer. Yeah. Maybe if he's right for you or not, but you can kind of get started in that studio world, and there's artist management over right. here. So it's just I get it. surrounding all areas that a young artist would need to That's great. So you, you're, you're, you know, you're aiming to be a one-stop shop, but you're not looking to be management. Well, no, no, we actually, I mean, with Florida Georgia provide? Line, we have a publishing deal, we have a management deal, and a production oh, yeah. deal, and actually, after we launched them, Universal Republic Records, yeah. technically, we're in business with them for, mm. for an, the next development act, because they saw what we were doing. I see. That's the other thing. See, labels are now coming to do Yeah, they want somebody to do the hard part. Loyola. Yeah. Hey, we want your next artist that comes, and so, yeah, they came and yeah. funded part of our company, and we would own, oh, the next artist to Universal Republic. Hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of... And, and, you know, I didn't cover this, but how big is, uh, how big is the company, um, well, you know, in total? How many employees? Well, six songwriters That's... now, right now. I think the, it, but on the staff side? On yep, the, you know. on the staff side, six songwriters. So songwriters, the staff would be me. Uh, I pitch song yeah. and manage the songwriters. Kimberly, kind of part-time. She does demo billing, mm -hmm. pays for administrative office management, and then a lady named Amy, receptionist and catalog management. So there would be three, and we just hired our first employee beyond me wow. on Mountain. Wow. So the management. So you're, you're, a, you're a, a less than seven person. Oh, yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not big. And, and matter of fact, the only reason we're in the building we're in is because Craig dabbles in real estate, and he's in that big building. Most, most houses are in houses, or right. most uh, companies are in houses. Right, so, right. You know, not huge. I think this has been hugely uh, illuminating, and it, it, it taught me a lot. I don't know a lot about Nashville. I've managed rock acts for my whole life and worked at Warner Brothers, but I've never dealt with songwriting in a Nashville setting. I know a couple people who have, but... It's not like anywhere. It's, uh, New York really and L.A. are not like Nashville. No. Uh, L.A. is becoming a, a bit more collaborative than it used to. There's no, right. not to be Debbie Downer, but there is no songwriter scene in New York. No, no. Really. It seems like and, and there's, as of late, but a big mass exodus out of L.A. to Nashville. A lot of people can live there more reasonable yeah. and be a relevant pop writer in Nashville. Right, so, right. Or rock writer. Well, um, I hope you guys have questions. Anybody want to be first? Who wants to be first? Yes, Paul. Uh, you like oh, you need the microphone, Paul. Hurry up, Kevin. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you make like 80 demos a year. Uh, how do you manage your catalog growing so fast? Um, well... We turn, I turn it all into the publishing company, and it's their job to have it in the system and know the songs and uh, know what know what song sh should you know should we pitch the song to whoever. It's basically Seth's job to know all of my songs. Right, right. And yeah. and yeah. it's a, you know I know that's a lot, but you know not necessarily all the songs are just country pitches. Some could be like uh, for a TV show, for a movie soundtrack, whatever. Right, right. Um, is that, did I answer your question or? So the relationships that you manage are, you know, every music supervision, producers, talk Artists. about that. Yeah, yeah. A&R, any, anyone, um, anyone that can get a song, a song, we keep saying cut, that's lingo for yeah. recorded. Yeah. Songs yeah. record, songs cut. Anybody, I mean, I don't, if you tell me, Tim McGraw's bus driver will play him a song, I'll give him, I'll give his bus driver a CD of songs. You know, that's, yeah. that's the way. You know, Nashville's always trying to find a creative way to get it done. So right. any, any barrier of entry, thankfully, as you kind of get more experience, you, you start getting one-on-one -on -one relationships with artists. They want your songs as bad as you want them to have them. Yeah, yeah. Because a hit song can really launch a career, so. Right. Hit it, Kevin. Run. 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 <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, do you have any say in like the musicians that play on your demo? Like, can you say like, oh, I like this bass player, I want him to play on it, or does like oh. the publishing company pick all those guys? Oh no, we pick, we hand pick the players we want to play. I mean, I have an exclu you know, I have like, you know, my first choice of guitar, second, third, fourth, on down the line. We try to put together the best band that we can when we go in. But yeah, we, we, and we honestly, the music business has in Nashville is degraded to the point to where we can get the best guys and guys that 10 years ago or five years ago only played on master recordings that are, you know, on records. We can have them come in. They'll play for 180 bucks for three hours. They got to work because there's not need, many master they records. They need the money. So we, yeah, we, yeah. it's actually worked in our benefit. We can get the best players in town to come in and play on a demo. And, 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 when, you're, when you have a little bit of success, and like I talked earlier, there's a chance that what you record might get upgraded to a master scale recording, which right. they're 180 bucks. They would get repaid another six or seven hundred dollars right. on top of that if we upgrade that to master. So meaning, I mean, meaning you use the the, the demo for the, the demo tracks as the master recording for the, for the record. Right, yes, right, right. and and like. The success that I've had, I'm going to have a better chance at getting this bass player that plays on all these records to yeah. come play on my session because right. he knows there's a chance that that might happen. Right, right. But, so, but can, we do get we, the hand We've players. canceled demo sessions because we've lost certain players. Just so you, if, if a guy we want for a certain song is not available, we'll cancel it until we can right. get him. So, I mean, not, that's a little dramatic, but we would do that. You know, with, with, a, with 150 songs a year that you write, maybe 80, demo, 80 to 100 demos, we're, we're using these numbers. Do these songs... The unused songs, the songs that don't actually strike anyone's fancy that year, do they just dry up and blow away, or do songs come back to life from time to time? What happens? I mean, um, generally speaking. Uh, well, there's no, I mean. There's songs that will hang around for yeah, three yeah. I mean, as a, when I was an unknown songwriter, no one knew who I was. Yeah. My average song, it took about three years for somebody to What's record it? Uh, Tim McGraw has one of his songs out. It's number two, uh, called "One of Those Nights." Are there any country fans in here? Are we are we coming off like? No, there's country. Fans are we coming off like boring? Uh, this is the South. This is the South. Um, Rodney well, I has because like everybody's a country. Rodney fan. has Tim McGraw's single "One of Those Nights" right now, and that song's three years old. He wrote that uh, two and a half, two, two to three, somewhere in there, two and a half years, right. and a half years ago, and it just took that amount of time wow. to demo it, have an artist find some, you know, right. a song they like. Right. Put it on a record, goes to radio. Right. There's some. I have seen instances that you'll write a song two weeks later. It's on radio, but that's more rare. Yeah. yeah. So the well, problem, you just got to stick with. Well, it. I'm more thinking well, about the songs get, that were written years ago. We also get requests for like, you know, this such such and such TV show is looking for this kind of a song. Oh, this right. movie is yeah. looking for a song for this part of the movie. Right. So is that some and of the meta, could, metadata that you guys gather, like yeah. what themes of the songs? Yeah. Like, we just go to emotions. Right. Uh, a lot of times A and R people at labels are managing the cost of records and telling publishers what types of songs their artist needs. Yeah. yeah. I need a song. No more, no more guy girl love songs. We've got eight of them on the record. Right, we need right. a party song. So we go, a, go to our a catalog. Perfect example right now is a TV show Nashville. <laughs> there's there's there's. <laughs> she, she loves that show. <laughs> I just want my wife. You said was, that in the glasses. No, no, you, no, you said was, that. I saw you say that. My wife was watching the show on uh, DVR last night, and there's right. a song called Casino yeah. that a friend of ours, Natalie Hemby, wrote. And I heard that song probably three years ago, and nobody's recorded it. Wow. And uh, what is it, the blonde haired girl, the duo on the Claire, show? Or whatever her name is. Um, so yeah. They started singing the so song, and I was like, oh. "Holy crap, that's a Casino!" <laughs> that's not so. That, I mean, there's a lot of back catalog songs mm -hmm. getting cut for that TV that's show great, yeah. right now, and, so and that's, that's a big thing. That data collection is a big part of it, right? Yeah. You got all this metadata that means you know, this emotion. We need this emotion, this subject matter, and you can. Sorry, I'm talking. There's somebody. To he's something. got the mic up here. How do you uh, avoid writer's block? Like fishing. Fishing? I do. I, why avoid it if you can go fishing? I, fishing. Why avoid it? I fish a lot. I, I fish a lot of tournaments, and uh, I live three blocks from the boat ramp, uh, Old Hickory Lakes, on the north side of Nashville. Right. So I, I do. I, I go, I go fishing a lot. But I treat it like a job. I mean, I show up every day. A lot of songwriters, when they finally get a publishing deal, they think, "Oh, I've made it. I can just like." You know, yeah. go get hammered every night and get up at noon and go smoke weed with my buddy and try to write a song. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, a year later, they don't have a, a deal anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, 
I, I tell people I think my farming background, I, you know, I got up and drove a tractor 12 hours a day for yeah. 15 years. That helped, that's really helped me treat Your songwriting like a yeah. job. But as far as writer's block, I mean, I probably get about maybe 10 or 12 good ideas a year to write. Right. And yeah. then most of the other time, it's just show up. My, my, one of my publishers used to say, you have to be present to win. Yeah. The old yeah. raffle thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's part of it. If you show up every yeah. day, you never know what's going what's gonna to come out. Somebody right. might say something. You'll start a song. You say, oh, that's cool. You know, chord mm -hmm. progression, whatever. Here's a great melody. What does that sound like? Oh, and you start writing some lyric, and you never know where it's going to yeah. go. Right. And that's right. a pretty cool process yeah. to just make something up yep. out of thin air. Yeah. Well, that's people ask us what we do. We make shit up. Well, yeah. even as a publisher. <laughs> That's well, yeah. we well, you also make you also make money from your imagination, right. which is which is pretty I, pretty remarkable. We'll even tell the writers there's definitely a time to go flush the radiator and get off the grid a little bit and get excited to go write songs. But if you only write when you get inspired and you wait until that happens, if he only wrote those ten or twelve times a year, he wouldn't be a great songwriter. Yeah, so right, right. you got to write when you don't feel like writing at times as well. But. Who else? You just yell it out. Go for it. Just trying to get it on the table. <laughs> like this guy, <laughs> this guy is going to nice. face plant. Um, so I've got a couple questions, just because as a songwriter and someone who's also done work experience at a publishing company, this is just like really relevant for me. So thank you very much. But um, what I wanted, what I want to ask is, you actually touched on this a little bit um, towards the end of when you guys were talking about like just the different cultures of the cities between Nashville, LA, and, mm -hmm. and New York, and. Uh, you know, I'm graduating this year trying to figure out my next moves and where to go. And so I wanted, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more, like is there space or becoming more space for people to go to Nashville that maybe like writing country songs won't resonate with as much? Like is, can you be a part or other genre? Like, right. is, is it, if you're not gonna be doing country s stuff, is it a bad idea to go to Nashville? No, absolutely not. Yeah. Kings Leon came out of Nashville. Um, I mean, if, dude, if, if, if you do something- Lamp Chop. <laughs> who, what's that? Lamp Chop. Lamb, Lamb Chop, they're an amazing band. Lamb Chop? Yeah, seriously, Kurt Wagner. Rockin', all right. Um, Does nobody know Lamb Chop? <laughs> what? I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm trying to, sorry, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, resonating. KG Elephant came out of the area. There's this band Mona. There's a bunch of stuff I'm not. Kesha. Kesha, thank you. Kesha was out of Nashville. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, look, there's a, yeah. there's a really cool indie scene in Nashville, and actually, both ASCAP and BMI yeah. have each hired one individual who is specifically responsible for everything non-country. So they'll put on non-country writers nights. They'll put on showcases for bands that are rock or hip hop. Or it's actually pretty hip. Some of the stuff that's coming out of there. Bluebird's still good for like non-traditional singer songwriters. Oh uh, man, I tell you what, Bluebird is great. Don't get me wrong, but especially since the show Nashville oh. has has been featuring Bluebird, they've actually built an entire other Bluebird just for the set because they put it in every episode oh, and now I mean the Bluebird it's sold out it's just a tourism but it's great don't get me wrong like it's it's um it's still great because songwriters still go play there but yeah it's, I knew um, that in grimy so that's like the only two things there's I actually by the way there's a there's an event coming up I think it's around your spring break Tin Pan South is that in March oh April I was gonna say I, I didn't know if it was like a spring break time any like intense songwriter oriented people come up for Tin Pan South it's like a three or four day festival, and I think you can buy a pass that'll get you into everything. Huh. But I don't know if they have a student rate or whatever, but you can literally go to writer's nights three or four nights that week, two or three rounds a day, and you will just see wow. some of the most brilliant people. That's coming, Tin Pan South. That's great. Cool, thanks. Who else? Spencer, right there. So it sounds like you guys are like cutting records and demos constantly, or maybe not, but you know, you got six writers, and do you guys have like engineers in a studio that you go to that are just like always on standby for you? Because clearly they're not on your staff. We heard all of that. I have, an, I have an engineer in a studio, a buddy of mine that owns a studio who's also an engineer that I've used for probably 10 years now, and he's, very, he's on the very progressive side. He keeps up with, you know, all the new programs, all the new uh, plugins and, plug -ins and and uh, stuff that's coming out just to keep the you know the sound current. I mean, you have some studios that, and guys that never upgrade, and they'll mm -hmm. quickly become yeah. get behind and become out of vogue. But um, no, I use the same uh, guy, and he they actually have a uh, 
the last year and a half, I used to book my own band and go in and do five or six songs and turn them in. Now a, lo a thing that's becoming real popular in Nashville is called uh, one offs they call it a one-off session. They book a band, but it's always the guys that, that I like, like they know who I like, and they say, how many songs you want? And I, I go, well, I've got these two songs I know I need to do, so give me two songs. So and they'll I, budget time for six songs. But there'll be six different, right. yeah. So I'll right. take two spots in the session, show up. Jim will take two, and you'll take two, and you guys and will split the But cost. I don't have any songs. <laughs> Well, but it'll, the clock's ticking. Figure something we out. Have the, we have 30 I'm gonna go home. piece to get the guts of the song down. And right. then um, yeah. I use it. I mean, when I'm, when I'm in town riding, I do that every week. I'll, That's great. That's I'll like share, you know, sharing a track to track. And, the, and another good thing is instead of turning in five or six songs to Seth, and there's two or three that immediately jump out to him, he pitches them, and the other ones, like you said, drop and blow away. Yeah, yeah. I'm trickling the songs in. I'm giving yeah. him two or three at a time, and he's like. It's actually been. Unbelievably so better because cool. I'll get one or two songs I'm fired up about rather than trying to look at six new ones yeah, and figure yeah. out what to do with all of them. Yeah, yeah. And I'll pick up the yeah. phone and call someone and stick your neck out in line for one song. Like, dude, you got five minutes. I got, I'm gonna play you one song. You better have you better have a great song. It's okay to get passed on, yeah. but rather than going, man, I want to come sit in front of you for 30 minutes and play you eight songs yeah. and figure out which one you like. Stick your neck out there in the brand new song of the week and figure out who needs to hear it first. Yeah, that's really funny. I, I've noticed in, in, in the lives of rock musicians, and people who are uploading one song a month are getting a lot more attention for every single song than they, mm -hmm. than they were when they were putting out an album every 18 months. You know, mm -hmm. there's so many songs that just weren't getting any attention. I think there's a time and a place for both. I mean, um, you see Blake Shelton have a resurgence besides TV, but he was doing these little six packs. Yeah. So he got relevant quicker and had content faster. But I think you also need an album's worth of material because oh, sure. at some point you're going to have to play 75 minutes in front of people and you got to have some people, you know. And you need a reason to tour arenas. Yeah. And, yeah right. Sorry, we got off. We really got off what you asked about engineers. Yes, there is a big place for engineers. In, but I'm not going to lie, that industry is declining a little bit because you can make something sound in your dorm room the same way you can with a big SSL board. You need to know how to use that stuff if that's what you want to do. But because technology is shrinking, it, it has weeded some people out, but there's still a lot of studios in Nashville, probably more than any other city, LA, because LA is too expensive. It's unbelievable, so, um, sorry. There's a, there is a place for people that are just engineer. One last, one last quick one. Yeah, to kind of add on to that, do you ever, oh, um, do any songwriters ever write with a Pro Tools assistant, like, Kind of what you were saying with someone writing it demos into the box and then that getting to become well, a master. We, we write with yeah. other songwriters that are Pro Tools guys, like um, track guys. Yeah, yeah. And they'll, they'll be like my, the guy at our company, Chris Tompkins, is a Pro Tool track guy. He'll be building a track as I write the song. He'll right. be building something. I'll be working on the lyric. He'll turn around and he'll say, hey, what about this? Or what about yeah, this yeah, melody? Or right. if there's three of us in the room. Right. So, yes, we do, we do write and build tracks at the same time too. But in, that, in, in Nashville, it's typically only songwriters that are proficient in Pro Tools. I will say, and I thought that's the only way it worked. The answer is yes, but not in Nashville. I, I just went to Miami, um, Florida Georgia Line is doing a guest appearance on a hip hop record to come out in the summer that I can't say. But we were in this studio in Miami. It was like the, in, in Miami, it's like the Hit Factory mm -hmm. and Circle House are the two big studio and this house, they had multiple studio rooms, and one room was like Rico Love, the pop writer. I don't know if anybody knows who that is. And then in the back, it was weird. They, they transformed the pool house into Pharrell Williams. It's his space. Yeah. So there's actually engineers, because they write differently to tracks, and right. there's that, that world is not so Nashville. There are a couple of studio guys LA, right. in LA and Miami a little bit, but not. Yeah. You know, there was, yeah. John, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to ask you, uh, when your contract is up, do the copyrights revert back to you, or do they stay with the publishing house? Well, not just you, but I mean, as a general field. As a songwriter, as your career progresses, progress, progresses, you get to, you have more power if you're successful, and you can sign better and better contracts. And I do know writers that have signed contracts to where, you know, five years from now or seven years from now, all this comes back to me, right, right. and I'm not to that point in my career yet, right. um, but, but in, in general, usually not, not but, in Yeah, yeah and I, like an initial but, songwriter contract is for life of copyright, right? Yeah, yes, but there are, there are publishing contracts in Nashville. P 
people I know that are getting full reversions, I would never do it as an independent. That, and I'm not saying independents don't do it, but that's a, that's a major publisher move. Because a lot of the major publishers literally are, uh, their goal might be market share. It might not be profitability. It literally might be, we want to have Everybody. the largest percentage yeah. of s songs exploited this year. So in order to do that, they may just give a really favorable deal and full reversions, but you got to have some so leverage. If, if Rodney's not working with you in 10 years from now, where the song takes place, do you still pay him a percentage? We, we have made an agreement in how we're going to own the publishing, right? The more leverage he has, the more he gets to own. And vice, as he becomes a veteran writer, the more leverage he can. But yes, in 10 years, if one of these songs that we are under agreement in now someone records it in 10 years, we will split the royalty off that. Or he will, maybe if he left with an unrecouped balance, sorry to get two, that will go to repay that unrecouped balance. Right, right, right. If that makes sense. All right, well, thank you very much. We could talk all night. <laughs> Except, um...